Hi, I'm Wes Allen with DM Tales, and I've been trying to get this review done for a couple of weeks now. This is my look at the new revised edition of Swords and Wizardry Complete. Let's roll it. Thank you to all my patrons for supporting this channel. You make a lot of things possible, and if you would like to join in, check the description below. This is an update to the old Swords and Wizardry Complete, which was published by Frog God Games. Uh, Matt Finch, who is the author of the game, has since created his own company, Mythmere Games, and has released this new edition. They started a successful Kickstarter back in March of 2023. The promise at the time was that the books would be shipping at about November of 2023, which is a really fast turnaround for a Kickstarter, if you've had any experience with that. Here's the thing, though. This is the fastest I've ever seen a Kickstarter actually fulfilled because the books started shipping in July. And when I got back from my vacation, this was waiting for me, for me to devour when I got home. Really, really cool. Now, Matt had already pretty much had the book done by the time the campaign for the Kickstarter actually started, but... Even so, being able to navigate through the printing process to get the books out that fast is really impressive. And I have to tip my hat to Myth Mirror Games for actually pulling it off. It is remarkable. In the Kickstarter, I opted for the traditional offset hardback book, which is absolutely beautiful. It is a full-size book at 8.5 by 11, which is the same dimensions as the previous version of the game. The logo on the front is done by Errol Otis. Uh, he also did the cover for The Last Swords and Wizardry Complete, so it's a nice continuity there. Uh, he also did the cover for the Softbound Edition, uh, or for the Print on Demand Edition, I should say, and that is absolutely beautiful. And I have to say, I'm probably going to pick up that version of the book as well once it's available for general purchase, because it is absolutely lovely. There's nothing on the interior pages, so that's a little bit of a disappointment. I would have loved to have seen that over opened up to some more artwork of Errol Otis, for example. The book is also printed on semi-gloss paper, so it's going to have a little bit of a glare when you're reading with direct light sources around. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, it's okay. It's not too distracting, and it's not such a high gloss that it's really annoying, but I miss my flat paper for reading books. It's just so much cleaner of an experience. There's also no book ribbon in this offset print book, which I love my book ribbons, but the book is so short, it's not really that big of a deal. All in all, I love the way that this book turned out. In fact, the gold ink on the outside cover of the book in the hardback edition is absolutely beautiful. It just pops. And it's really cool because if you read the back of the book, and I'm not going to give it away, there is actually a quote from Led Zeppelin that explains why it is that there's gold ink on this book, which I thought was a really nice touch. This, if you can get a hold of it when it becomes generally available, this is going to be one you want to have on your shelf. The layout of this new version is a lot lighter. It's very clean compared to the older edition. The previous edition of Swords and Wizardry Complete was very heavy. Uh, lines were very thick. The heading fonts were this very stylized font that had a very thick weight to it. All the dividing lines on it were very thick as well. It had a very mid-2000s aesthetic to it with this heavy dividers between the table rows and all the very different dark colors for the alternating rows and tables. All these things kind of poured together to create something that had a lot of gravity to it. And it was really good. And in fact, when I read Swords and Wizardry last year, the previous edition that is, I still thought it was very attractive and it looked really nice. Everything about that heaviness of the older edition, however, has been now toned down. Lines have become a lot thinner. Instead of the very heavy uh, heading font that's very stylized and decorative, it's now using a very clean and classy looking sans serif font. There's also no headers in the book. Instead, on the first page of each chapter, the chapter title is actually rotated 90 degrees and stuck as a large sans serif font uh, on the right page of the spread. And then in 
subsequent pages for that section, you're going to have a kind of a ripped paper texture on the right page of that spread uh, with the 90 degree of a smaller version of that sans serif font declaring what section you are in. It, again, like everything else in this layout, it's very, very clean. It gets out of the way, but when you need it, it is there for you. Footers are also very subtle. On the left page, you have your page number, the book title. On the right page, you have your section title, followed by the page number. Really fast, really clean. It is a classic looking book uh, that is a really a joy to look at. The tables have been retooled. There's no longer the heavy separator lines from one row to the next or one column to the next. It allows you really to use your eyes to track across. The alternating row colors have also been toned down. So it's a lot easier on the eye. You don't get as tired as you're reading through the book. All told, the design is very clean. It is very light. Things like lines and dividers and all that are very thin. It's very easily readable and it's visible. You can notice it, but at the same time, it gets out of the way so you can read the book. And I find that to be a very remarkable accomplishment. The artwork is also wonderful. It is mostly inked line art, absolutely stunning, really evokes that old school feel of the game books of old. Uh, I would have liked to have seen more of this incredible artwork in the bestiary. Um, that's going to be a universal want, I think, through every book that I go through because art is expensive and to, to throw more artwork inside the bestiary for all these different creatures that you're describing, particularly for ones that people have seen in their imaginations for years that they're playing old school games, gets really expensive. And not only that, it increases page count number, which is also something you have to be cognizant about when you're creating these books. So I would have loved to have seen more artwork. I'm hoping some more official artwork might come out as a supplement for things like VTT tokens or something, because I'd like to see their take on these wonderful old school creatures. Um, but all told, the art is very pretty and it's a nice to flip through the book, particularly when all the character classes are introduced, some really great portraits of each of them. It's a great update to the game. So if you're not familiar with Swords and Wizardry, it is actually an original or OD&D retro clone. And it is a faithful representation of that game, but it adds some of its own goodies. For example, instead of having the full list of different categories of saving throws that you would have had in the old school game, many of which seemed arbitrary for what you used depending on the situation, Swords and Wizardry just gives you a single saving throw number for your class that you can modify for your class based on your level or your race that you're using at the time. And the GM can then alter that saving throw depending on the situation. Really fast and really flexible. It's something I really like. I appreciate it a lot about Swords and Wizardry. Also, the game does include a rule for ascending armor class instead of descending armor class. The default is descending armor class, so you still have all your old attack matrices. But in each character, or each NPC or monster, there's going to be a bracketed number there that's going to be their ascending AC. And then on page 39, there is actually a chart that's going to explain how you give your character an attack bonus if you don't want to use those attack matrices. I like how Swords and Wizardry is able to blend together two different versions of playing the game while keeping the math all the same. And they do this a whole lot because even with saving throws, they give you alternate versions of if you want to use the old categories, here they are. This is something you can do. They do it for armor class, as I said. They also do it for the way that combat can be handled. All told, Swords and Wizardry really tells the person who is reading the book and preparing to run the game, make this your own. Here are several ways that you can do things, but none of them are as valid as what you want to do at your table. That's really cool. But it doesn't just leave you hanging on the branch all on your own if you've never done this before. It will often present you with one, two, or even three ways of doing something and say, here are some ways that we did it back in the day. If you would like to use these or hack them, there you go. All told, the way this is presented is inviting, it sparks an imagination, and it encourages GMs and players to hack the game to make their table their own. And the permission to hack it is right there in the official core rulebook. That's something that I really love. 
Now, there are the six core key attributes that everybody knows and loves who has ever played Dungeons and Dragons. However, in this game, there's no point buy or standard array. You roll 3d6 and the rule as written typically is to go straight down the line. Although again, a GM is encouraged to allow people to modify where they're putting their abilities depending on the needs of the table. What is really different, however, are the fact that modifiers are so much smaller. A lot of them only have a minus one or a plus one to their different modifiers that they give you. And things like your bonus to hit or your bonus to damage, depending on your strength score, well, in Swords and Wizardry, as in the original game, that's really only meant to be applied to fighters. So if you're a cleric with a strength of 18, you're not necessarily going to be getting all of those bonuses to apply wrath to your foes. One of the nice things is in a small footnote on the table for strength and the modifier and how they're only supposed to be for fighters is that a lot of tables do like to give certain bonuses to characters depending on greater strength. And so they say, you know, if players really want that, just give them, no matter what their score is, if they're above a certain number, give them a plus one. And that's a way of balancing out. It keeps the fighters feeling that they have something that is unique to their class and makes the ability scores actually feel like they matter to other characters. It's a really nice balance. And again, it works right in with Swords and Wizardry's philosophy of making Make this table your own. Here's our advice. There are nine classes in this game. Assassin, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Magic User, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, and Thief. It's a really wide mix of character types that you can play to create the type of hero that you want. There are also five ancestries in this game. Swords and Wizardry and this new revised edition is going to be jettisoning the old word of race. They're going with ancestry now and they're pulling in the idea that culture can be part of this as well. So you have the classic ancestries, dwarves, elves, half elves, humans, and halflings. Your ancestry is also going to limit your character type that you can generate. This goes back into all game balance because ancestries have special abilities that some others do not. And so you're trying to keep the power at least a little bit balanced between the different characters. So certain ancestries are only gonna be able to choose certain classes if they're going to be a PC. And even then they're only gonna be limited depending on their class to certain levels. As I've been playing for a few years in an old school game, basic fantasy RPG, and no one's gotten over level six yet, that's not necessarily the great cap that some people think it actually is. A lot of people don't ever get past level six. There are two basic alignments for characters to choose from to play that is law and neutrality. A GM is also allowed or players may ask the GM if they're allowed to play chaotic characters. These are all trying to riff off of that older concept of alignment being your kind of philosophical outlook on the universe. These are great cosmic forces that you are aligning yourself with. I have to admit that the three-pronged approach to alignment is something that I wrestle with, mostly because anytime I've read the descriptions of law or neutrality or chaos, and they say they're trying to get away from this being morality, we're still using words like good and evil and bad and all these things that will evoke the sense of moral outrage or moral uprightness, depending on alignment. Um, it's a struggle that I think no game's ever going to solve, and Swords and Wizardry being a retro clone that's pulling this in, it's just pulling in that older mentality. For me, I probably would play with a nine-pronged alignment to give people, yeah, I'm chaotic, but I want what's best. I want life to happen, so I'm good. That's my interpretation of good, by the way. Um, or if I'm lawful, I can be lawful evil or lawful neutral or lawful good. To me, that makes a little bit more sense and gives a little bit more flexibility. But more likely than not, I'm going to play Swords and Wizardry the way that I play Basic Fantasy, because in Basic Fantasy, there is no alignment system. Your character's alignment is what they do. So if they do good things, well, then they're good. If they do lawful things, then they are lawful. I like that idea of letting alignment kind of be emergent inside the system rather than being assigned at the beginning.
Now, the bulk of your experience points inside swords and wizardry is not going to come from killing monsters. It's going to come from treasure because one gold piece equals one experience point. So your characters do not want to become murder hobos. In fact, that's a very dumb thing to do because most of the things that you encounter inside a game, especially at low levels, can just kill you. So you want to get to the treasure as quickly and with as little combat as you possibly can. Combat should feel dangerous. So if you can negotiate your way through through a pass or an impasse, if you can sneak your way through to the treasure hoard and get away with it without having to have a big massive fight, that is actually really beneficial. Fighting is not your first or only option inside older school gaming. And that's one of the things I appreciate about treasure being one of the ways that you gain experience point or the majority of the way that you get your experience points. Now your character attributes, because your modifiers are so small are not necessarily the key to your character gaining power. Instead, each of your classes is going to have key attributes or core attributes. And if your player character has a score that is over 13, you are going to get a certain bonus for that. So if your primary attribute is 13 or above, you get a plus 5% in all experience earned. But in addition to that, if your wisdom is 13 or above, you get another 5% experience point earned. And if your charisma is 13 or above, you get another 5% percent on all experience points earned. So if you have a 13 or higher in all three of those traits, your primary attribute, wisdom, and charisma, you can get 15% added to all the experience points that you earn. That way, the ability scores are getting you developed faster as a character to get to more higher levels where you can survive longer and do more cool, wacky things. Really nicely done. Spell descriptions are presented in the book in alphabetical order. There are actually two indexes at the beginning of the spell section. Uh, the first is by their spell name and their page number next to it. The other is listed by spell class and their level. So they're grouped that way. So two indexes for the spells is really nice and alphabetical listing of the spells in order is also really nice. This is one of the cool things that I think more modern presentations of these old school games have come up with because I used to hate having to figure out, wait a minute, what level spell spell was this, I have to flip to this page instead of here. Alphabetical makes so much more sense. Really well done. The spell descriptions themselves are short, simple, and clean. They have the spell level, their range, and their duration. There is a short paragraph describing the effects of each of these spells, and there's sometimes a table to determine the type of effect or success the spell is having. Magic user spells in this book go all the way up to level 9. Cleric and Druid spells only go up to level 7. Different type of casting, different extent of the power of the spells. Now, the referee section of the book is also really nice. There is a sample dungeon in it, which is presented smaller than it was in the previous printing of Swords and Wizardry Complete. The presentation of the sample dungeon actually keys rooms one through five as an example, but there are many more rooms to fill in. Inside the section of the book is some nice, simple advice on how to balance a dungeon crawl between monsters, traps, and treasure. Really well done. Uh, there are some clean tables for generating what type of encounter you're going to have in any given room. So this is presented here almost like a B1 in Search of the Unknown that you can go through and key this room all by yourself and then run your players through it using the tools that are found in the book. This is a nice design. I appreciate it. Also in this book, there are some different types of combat that are presented, including mass and ship and aerial. These are always fun to throw your characters into different situations and watch them suffer. Yay! And I like the rules inside Swords and Wizardry because it gives you enough to work with and then trusts you to fill in the gaps with rulings at the table depending on the current situation. As with everything Swords and Wizardry does, giving you freedom to develop the game as you need it for your table, that's really key and core to its nature. Now the bestiary or bestiary is packed. Each creature block is exactly the same. There is starts with a simple list layout. There is a brief description of the special attacks or behavior of the creature. And then it's followed by a compact stat block that you can actually copy and then put into adventures. It's really cool. But there was one confusing thing for me because movement has changed in this edition, the complete revised edition, compared to the previous edition. 
So there's a single number for movement in each creature's stat block, like nine. There's no measurement given for it. There's no what concept is. Is it feet? Is it inches? What is it? That's all that it is. Then what you are told later on as you read is that the movement rate for combat is to take that movement rate of 9 and times it by 10, and that is their combat movement. So a goblin, which has a movement of 9, suddenly has a combat movement rate of 90 feet. This seemed a little much for me, particularly because in the previous edition of the game, as which tracks with a lot of old school games or retro clones, if you had this type of calculation, you would do nine times 10 and then divide it by three. And that was their combat move per combat round. A lot of people assume that the movement rate that is in the different stat blocks was for movement by turn, which is about 10 minutes as you were crawling through a dungeon. So I was confused by this. Was this a typo? Was this a deliberate shift? Because it seems really fast. Suddenly things are going to be moving a lot quicker. People are going to be engaging in melee a lot faster. What is going on here? So I actually emailed Matt Finch, and it was really fun because he contacted me then on Facebook saying, Hey, uh, Wes, I think you typed in your email address wrong. Uh, you typed it in DM Tales as in a mouse tail. I think you meant DM Tales as in, you know, a story, which is exactly what I had done. And I'm very grateful to Matt for actually going, Who is this dingbat who doesn't even know their own email address? Very grateful that he actually reached out to me anyway, and we had a good conversation. And he did indeed point out this was a deliberate switch. He had apparently had gone back, looked at the original game, and said, there is no rule about dividing by three for combat. I think that was like a house rule that became near universal. And when he got down to it, he's like, and when you think about it, 90 feet in 10 seconds, that's not that much. You can pretty much go that far in 10 seconds if you are moving really, really fast. And I, I was like, okay. And he's like, and this will allow people to like run and flank into different rooms and, and come at the creatures from behind instead of having to constantly just wait and then the battle's over by the time they get there. And that's the, the idea of what it was. Everything kind of is faster this way. I, I admit I didn't like this. I was like, that does, that seems too fast. That I don't know what I don't know if that's gonna work. And then I started looking at the way that combat is set up, because the default way that combat is set up for swords and wizardry is a lot like the way that Moldvay Cook Basic Expert does it. Combat is done via different segments where different actions take place. So first off, your initiative is done by group. So you alternate your movement through the steps, depending on who wins initiative. Ranged attacks and movement actually happen inside the same step. One side goes, and then the other side follows before you move on to the next step in initiative. So if you have somebody who is really, really, really fast and runs up to like a couple of archers to try to take them out, well, then the archer is going to be able to fire their arrows at them as they run up to engage in melee combat. The other cool thing about swords and wizardry is that there's no penalty for point-blank fighting. I think it's probably because ranged attacks of movement happen inside the same turn, so if you lose initiative, well, you're not going to sit there and just wait for 10 seconds while the guy runs up to you. You're going to fire that arrow eventually, and so that's the way that they handle it. So that kind of offsets the fast movement a little bit. Spells then go off, and then you have your melee attack. All this combined, I think, balances the encounter a little bit, which allows that free-range movement to be really cool and allow for a lot more wacky things to happen. So even though my instinct is to go, no, 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 we need to have a lot smaller movement than that. I mean, the 30 feet is the 30 feet. That's like sacrosanct, right? And, and Matt, I think, is keyed on something, going, well, why? Why can't we move faster? It just makes sense. Everybody's going to be running this way or that during combat. It's not necessarily going to be the static move where we go move 30 feet, wait for this person and go make it more freewheeling, make it more free flowing and watch the chaos unfold as these encounters happen. Also another reason yet again to try to avoid combat if you can, because it can get dangerous really fast as you get encircled. So initial response, I don't like this. The more I've chewed on it, I, I think this might be something worth trying. 
the book ends with a nice listing of treasure, how to roll up a treasure hoard, and then a great listing of magic items. And that's pretty much it. Everything you need to run this game is in the one core volumes that's sitting here on my shelf. And I really like it. Uh, there was something about it. I did not expect to have any sort of deep feeling for swords and wizardry because I had no nostalgia for it. I'd never played OD&D. I started with Moldvay Cook. And yet when I read the version that had been out previously and now the second version, there's something about it that I'm going, I got to take a look at this game at some point. There's something there that I think I'm missing and I really want to try it. So here's the thing, right now, if you are not a Kickstarter backer, you are not going to be able to get a print version of this game. You can buy the PDF through Mythmere Games or on Drive-Thru RPG. That is going to cost you a whopping $4.99. Walk, do not run, go get this now. I did ask Matt about when he expected general availability of the print on demand or even being able to purchase one of the nice offset print books from Mythmere Games. And he pointed out that pretty much after all the Kickstarter backers received their books, they would start being available for general sale. He's estimating probably in October. I would expect that maybe that's going to slip a little bit further back. After all, the original promise of the game was not to be out until November of 2023. And so if they hit October for general availability, well, that's just absolutely amazing. I want to find out how they're actually managing their logistics because, wow. So keep an eye out for it. I would expect that the cost of the book is going to be about what the Kickstarter backers paid. I paid $35 plus $5 shipping for my copy of Swords and Wizardry Complete Revised Edition. And the print-on-demand book inside the Kickstarter was going for $25. Again, this is not a game that's going to break the bank. And it's really cool, really fast, really beautiful. And I think it's a lot of fun to check out. Go get it yourself. So what do I have coming up on the channel? Well, I've gotten back to my live streams. My next live stream is going to be interviewing Luke Stratton, who is the author of Pirate Board. Um, that's going to be interesting because <laughs> that's a really dark game and I'm looking forward to having him on. But my next review of a book is going to actually be on Symbarum, which is a review copy that I got from Free League Press. Thank you for sharing it with me. And I finished this book since I've been back from vacation and Wow, this is a really cool system. Cannot wait to share it all with you. After that, I've got Dragon Bane to look at. Marvel Superheroes, Marvel Multiverses come in. I have got Fantasy Age 2.E uh, that I pre-ordered ages ago that showed up while I was on vacation. Got a lot of books waiting for me when I came back from vacation. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. I also have the Savage Worlds Adventure Editions Fantasy Companion, which I'm about a third of the way through at this point. Not sure where my review order is going to stand. If you want to join my Patreon, I do have a, have a pull up right now that you could actually vote to help direct where my next reviews go after some barum. Uh, that's always out there for you. Um, but that's going to be a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to it. So until we see each other again, folks, happy playing everyone.